Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and I am here to do a Facebook Live Q&A and I will be answering any of your questions on writing, self-publishing or any type of publishing really, book marketing and creative entrepreneurship. Basically anything you want to ask me, I'm here and uh, I'll be here for a little bit depending on how many questions we get but actually we already have some questions so I'm super excited about that so I'm going to tackle the questions that have already come in and if you're watching live you can type your questions into the comments and I will see them you can also press like and it's all very exciting and live so uh, okay so I'm going to start with the first question oh and you can say hello and like where you're where you are in the world I always like to know where people are um, watching from or calling from or whatever uh, it's, I'm, I'm still new at doing this Facebook live stuff so not too great um, okay so I'm going to oh hi Linda thanks for coming along and uh, so now uh, it's always nice to see when people are actually here <laughs> um, okay so I'm gonna uh, ask a, oh Lisa says hi from Texas hello Lisa lovely to see you here this evening or I guess in Texas it must be like lunchtime or something <laughs> um, okay Oh, Janita from, from Johannesburg. Fantastic. I haven't been there, although since we're an intimate group, I went to school in Malawi, which is a few countries above South Africa. So uh, that was a while ago now. But uh, yeah, anyway, would love to come back to Africa. Right. Anyway, I will start the questions and please uh, type your questions in as we go. OK, so Ruth says, uh, I've just finished the first draft of my first book. When planning multiple series, how would you approach it? Write all or one before you begin another, say three of seven, and then begin the second. Um, so if you finish the first draft of your first book and you're thinking about a series of seven, then good on you. <laughs> but um, I must say, I'm now on book nine of the Arcane series, and I always imagined it as a series. Um, but essentially, I, uh, you know, I didn't really plan that far ahead. So I would say if you can hold back, then awesome but often that first book is something we need to get out there in order to then kind of release the energy to do the next book I don't know people I mean there are people who hold back like I know Lindsay Baroka who's amazing um, just uh, released a pen name and she released I think three books in a new name and it is much better to do that but I personally wouldn't have the patience so yes it would be great if you could plan those books in a series and then release the first three or probably what I would do is I'd release the first two with the third on pre-order and put the first on a you know either a perma free or a or a you know a spike with KU and then see what happens happens that way. Uh, okay, so always wonderful to see the live comments. Um, hi, Ashling, thanks for coming. Uh, Niall says um, he's in Wicklow in Ireland. Fantastic. Uh, oh, Janita says I'm always welcome in Africa. Thank you so much. Um, Lisa says, I'd love to know, uh, love you to address the changing landscape of indie publishing and how daunting this is for those trying to decide which way to go. Uh, it seems that guidance written more than a year ago might be obsolete. Really good point, uh, Lisa. One thing I would say is that in any of these tech spaces, um, basically publishing is a tech space now, uh, change is going to be the only constant <laughs> and what I think actually is that as an indie as someone who owns my own rights that I have a much better chance of responding to a changing market than someone who signs away their rights to a publisher because let's face it publishers are super slow at reacting to changes in the market um, so for example even though you might um, you know, say you signed uh, a book deal for books just in America, then that that might be fine. But what about, uh, you know, as we're going to see in the next few years, some big changes with global Internet. And we mentioned Africa there. Mobile Internet access across the world will mean that selling books in other countries is going to be a bigger and bigger deal. Now, if you sell worldwide rights and your publisher doesn't exploit the books in those other countries, which they never do, <laughs> um, you know, most authors who sign away worldwide rights will not see their books published in you know over 100 countries they might see 10 maybe a few more so my personal opinion is to be ready to pivot and jump on the next thing that might come along which you can't do if you've signed your rights away however if you get offered a big deal then super duper um you know go for that 
Fantastic. But um, I think that what you'll find with traditional publishing is a much slower rate of change. Uh, so I guess it's what you can cope with. The other thing I would say, and I just was watching MasterChef, um, MasterChef uh, Celebrity. Um, I quite like MasterChef and uh, the lovely Jimmy Osmond was on it. And he's such such a nice guy. And it, but it, when watching him and they had a picture of him when he started performing at age three, you know, the Osmonds. Um, and it made me think, do you know, we're all doing this for the long term. So, hey, sign, you know, if you want to sell your rights to a book, no worries, because you're going to write another one. Um, we've got to have this long term mindset, I think. Otherwise, I think we just go crazy. I was I was um, relaxing earlier as well with uh, looking on the Kindle store, looking for an, an, a new book and was just like and I searched for, um, you know, books released in the last 30 days. And it was something like five and a half thousand books released in the UK store in the last 30 days. And I was just like, OK, how's anyone going to find mine? And yet they do. Um, so anyway, long term thinking, everyone. OK, that was a bit of a rant, wasn't it? <laughs> Uh, okay, Lisa says, are you taking Aaron Sorkin's masterclass? Yes, I am. Um, I did James Patterson's masterclass. This is at masterclass.com. And now Aaron Sorkin is doing one on screenwriting. Yes, I'm doing that as well. Highly recommend it. I take a lot of courses. Um, I've taken a lot from Dean Wesley Smith this year and Christine Catherine Rush. And um, I'm actually going to one of their um, coast workshops in Oregon. So I'm really, I continue to invest in my own education. I think it's so important. Uh, Niall asks, and I, I don't know if it's Niall or Neil, sorry, Niall, I'm going to go with Niall. Um, what do you usually pay for book covers on 99 Designs? Um, I can't remember. I think it's about $250, something like that. Um, but I have a whole load of, oh, and if you do use 99 Designs, use 99designs.com forward slash Joanna and you get a free power pack upgrade. <laughs> Wasn't expecting to do an ad read. Um, but also at thecreativepen.com forward slash book cover design, there's a whole load of other options and prices for book cover design really, really have a broad range between maybe $50 and $300, I would say. Uh, Henry, hi Henry, uh, says Dragon Anywhere worth the monthly subscription. Um, and well done again on the 100k. Thank you so much. Uh, I have now recovered. I will not be showing my feet on this live broadcast. <laughs> you do not want to see my feet. They're a bit of a wreck. Uh, anyway, Dragon Anywhere. If people don't know what Dragon Anywhere is, well, Dragon Dictate is a speech to text. So I speak and it types what I say. Dragon Anywhere is an app on your um, phone that will save it to the cloud. And I bought, I think I bought two or two months subscription in the end and I just cancelled it because I'm just not using it. So personally i think it's 10 pound 99 a month so it's quite expensive compared to buying the software outright which i already have so um i decided the monthly subscription was not worth it but uh, i might try it again but otherwise i use my voice memos on the phone uh okay linda says how have your audiobook sales changed um i've been listening to more books now and wondered if there's an overall increase uh, for non-fiction and fiction? It's a really great question, Linda, and something that a lot of us are thinking about. Okay, so for one, I'm also like you. I, in fact, just earlier when I was cooking dinner, I was listening to an audiobook. I'm listening to um, Jerusalem um, by Simon Seabag Montefiore. Um, I tend to only listen to these massive non-fiction um, books on audio. And I'm recording my own non-fiction, um, one of which I'm selling on uh, ACX and Audible, which is business for authors, and one of which now I'm selling direct on my website, which is the latest successful author mindset book. Now, what I think, but I'm continuing to do fiction on ACX. Now, what I've noticed is my fiction audiobook sales have really, um, the volume hasn't necessarily dropped off, but the income really has. Um, so I think what's happening, I mean, we know because we're now listening, is that when you are a, um, a subscriber and you pay a monthly fee so I think I only pay $7.99 or something like that for one book a month but that that audiobook Jerusalem is $24.99 but I got it for one credit so the author and the narrators and producers will get a lot less money through my subscription than if someone had bought it directly so what's happening I think is as um, people get into audiobook listening they're paying less it's like the streaming music uh, situation so all I can say is I think there are more listeners and there are less 
uh, there's less money, <laughs> which is a bit of a pain. Um, what I would say is that I talked to Damon about this from Book Funnel on the podcast and said, you know, will he do some kind of, um, you know, delivery system so that I can sell audiobooks more easily because at the moment if people buy my audiobooks from my website they have to download the mp3 then they have to load the mp3 onto their device whereas with audible as you know you just buy it and there it is on your phone and you can just start listening so i want to have that i think as soon as we get that smooth interface um the side loading for audio i think uh, or if anyone knows what that is already that would be great uh okay so and i know uh, okay, so and I know sometimes I drop out. So if I drop out, you just just refresh the Facebook page and try again. Okay, Lisa says, if you were only writing fiction, would you write a blog? Would you podcast? Really great question, Lisa. I probably would still blog to a point um, because I do on jfpen.com. I tend to put stuff about my, uh, research. I also, what I'm doing on jfpen, actually, this is a, an idea that some people might like. Um, if you go to jfpen.com forward slash now, N O W, um, you'll see that instead of blogging, I just kind of update every three weeks with what I'm working on. And I put pictures. Um, I also share a lot of pictures on my Facebook page on facebook.com forward slash jfpen author. Um, I blog occasionally, so I do interviews with other um, thriller writers. I do videos about my research. Um, so I would still blog as I do, but I definitely wouldn't podcast. Um, I say I definitely wouldn't. I don't know. You know, it's very difficult at this point, but I haven't started a fiction podcast. I have actually bought a domain um, supernaturalthrillers.com which I might do something with I'm not sure yet um, but I do think that the only way forward in the mass of content is curation and if I can curate supernatural thrillers somehow then that might be a way for my own books to be discovered um, so that's something I'm thinking about with fiction but certainly I would not be blogging in the same way as I do for the creative pen Victoria says, um, how is the best way to protect your literary work? I've actually had a rough draft stolen. Um, so I'm not quite sure what you mean by stolen there. Like if it was printed out and left on a table and someone walked off with it, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, I think the best way to protect it, um, if you look at, there's an interview on, uh, on the podcast with Orna Ross and also another one with Helen Sedwick about copyright. Um, and you know, the copyright being a passive right, again, I'm not a lawyer, blah, 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 but, um, you don't have to register copyright, but you can. Um, and in fact, when I submitted destroyer of worlds to an agency in india they the first thing they said is you really must submit this and get this copyrighted like with the copyright agency so if you just google copyright in your country you can um submit it there uh but yeah i mean to be honest that's probably as much as i would do um you can set up google alerts on your name but everyone gets pirated it's not that big a deal anyway i hope you're all enjoying this um and that uh, this is fun uh, I'm just going to refresh that page. I've got I've got the phone and I've got the laptop and uh, and a cup of tea this evening. Cup of peppermint tea. Okay, next one. Michael says, can you talk a bit about driving readers to your mailing list using Facebook ads when you don't have any social proof to brag about? I don't think you need any social proof to be. Look, let's think about Facebook. You're on Facebook now. <laughs> okay, the reason I'm doing these videos is because they get loads of interest people like videos on facebook have you noticed <laughs> i would i mean and i haven't done any for fiction yet but i think i'm going to because it and i almost i tried i went to uh, chepstow castle today and tinton abbey in wales and i was planning to do a facebook live video on my fiction page for um tinton abbey which is like amazing and very awesome and i thought this would be great but there was no signal <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't do that. Um, but in terms of Facebook ads, I don't think you need to say social proof. You don't need to say a thousand downloads or a million downloads like Mark does or New York Times bestselling author. Um, I don't think you need that. Um, I think you can just have an awesome picture. Like I think picture and um, a really good hook is enough, to be honest. Um, and that is difficult. <laughs> 
I actually think that's far more important than social proof. Um, so yeah, if you can come up, I mean, that's how Adam Croft made like the million dollars that he made this year. And you can look at the interview I did with him about that. Um, but basically he had a good picture and a good hook, really good. No one cared about his social proof. Um, oh, Linda says, how do you keep from getting overwhelmed by information when taking all these classes? Great question. And um, I realized that my own information could be overwhelming for a lot of people. Okay, so my um, method in all this madness is consumption, creation. Consume something, create something. So last weekend I did this uh, 100K Waste to the Stones and I wrote a blog post which was lessons learned from walking 100k race to the stones and so what i did is i took the and that wasn't really consumption it was like a you know <laughs> well a, a goal but i took the experience and i created my lessons learned and then often i will print those out and i'll put them in my diary my journal one of the many journals uh, i have behind me um so i could that's how, basically how i do anything whenever i take a course i write notes um i've got uh, a couple of, uh, I can show you here, a couple of moleskin journals. I have a little one for my little handbag and uh, the bigger ones um, for when I am uh, um, at courses and things. And I will just write notes on things and then I will turn that either into a blog post or I'll write notes for a book or whatever I do. But I always consume something and create something from that information within a short period of time. Otherwise, as you say, it just kind of disappears. Uh, Keith asks, are email open rates pretty accurate or are there things similar to Facebook edge ranking 20 to 30 percent email open rate is good um, even though people have opted in? What advice do you have on getting high email open rates? <sighs> do you know what? I am not an expert in email open rates. <laughs> <laughs> I think that if you look at industry standards on email, it's not very good. I actually think 20 to 30% email open rate is probably really good. Um, you know, we're all overwhelmed with email. Absolutely. I mean, I don't open most of the email in my inbox um, unless it's, you know, personalized in the header somehow. So yeah, I think that we need to keep going with email lists. Um, and I do, I put out email, you guys are probably on my email list, but uh, I don't obsess about open rates, just like I don't obsess around sales figures um, because it would just make me depressed. So um, one very good thing about building your email list is that you can then use that in Facebook for advertising and uh, it can be like geo-targeting as well. So I'm doing a um, workshop in November in London. Henry's coming. Thank you, Henry. Um, and that I will be doing some like geo-targeting email directly to UK people only for that workshop so I think there's lots of things you can use email for but you shouldn't expect people to always open your emails but probably in terms of advice of getting better um, the person I think is one of the best copywriters around right now um, is Nick Stevenson if you sign up for his stuff and just copy and paste his emails into a like a page document word document he does very very good emails they're personal they have good headlines um i'm kind of jealous um but there you go nick is very good at that and i'm better at other things <laughs> remember this is not a competition um okay uh how do you brian says how do you tackle marketing of a book on kobo or itunes compared to amazon Okay, so yeah, going wide. First of all, I do not suggest you try going wide unless you um, actually have more than, well, th at least three books that are related. So three books in a series or, um, you know, three books for authors or three nonfiction books to the same niche. Um, and then there are a couple of things. So iTunes really, really likes perma-free. They really like perma-free first in series and they will, they have promotional stuff around that. Um, both Kobo, well, Kobo has merchandising that you can get into if you have a decent backlist. You can um, email Mark Lefebvre at Kobo and ask to get into the promotional um, back end, which is like, it's a beta program and they will let you in if you have a big enough backlist that is worth merchandising. And you have to be honest with yourself. If you've got one book and, you know, 
then just stay in KDP Select. If you are taking this seriously, you've got a number of books or, an, or a series, then it's worth merchandising at these other stores. Box sets are awesome. So definitely box sets at Kobo and iTunes are much better. And remember, you can do over $9.99. So um, I've got an eight book box set at iTunes at the moment, and that is um, in a promotion. So the other secret is uh, relationships. And the only way to make relationships is time and going along to events. Now, I know that's not um, possible for everyone, but uh, you know, if you're in England, then the London Book Fair is really good for meeting people from the various retailers. Um, if you're in America, then any of the genre conventions, you know, if you go to RWA for romance, Thriller Fest, um, I don't know some of the other ones, but um, there'll be lots of conventions or writers, uh, workshops and things like that. If you can meet the retailers and then ask them, they are all really nice. You can say, look, um, I'm struggling to get any traction. What, it, you know, what, what possibilities are there? And that's really the only way. Uh, Niall asks, what are you planning to do after the Arcane series? Well, the Arcane series is never ending. <laughs> the nine books will be one cycle, but I've got a whole spin-off cycle that's coming. Um, I also have the London Psychic trilogy, which I'm going to spin off that into something else. Um, I've got a pagan cycle kind of coming, which is based on moving out to the west of England and Wales and Ireland, in fact, um, and Cornwall and kind of looking at the whole um, old ancient pagan England. Um, if people have read Barbara Erskine, uh, who wrote Lady of Hay and some other books, I'm really interested in the way she does time shifting. Uh, it won't be romance, won't be time shifter romance, but it might be some, there might be some time shifter thriller um, anyway, there'll be demons, there'll be supernatural, there'll be pagan stuff. Uh, so yeah, supernatural thrillers still, but I have lots of ideas. Uh, Jerry says, how far in advance do you make your books available for pre-order? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Okay, so uh, pre-orders, mixed opinions on pre-orders. I'll tell you why pre-orders are awesome, because we as indies don't have someone, generally we don't have a project manager going, hey, do this today, do that today, do this today. And most of us don't even have a checklist, <laughs> let's face it. So basically, when you have a pre-order, you get all your ducks in a row early. So your um, live date, everything's done and it's really awesome. You can focus on your social media, you can focus on whatever else you're doing, your email, etc., etc. But all your books, you know, your books are loaded up, you know, all the formatting's right, you've checked all your pages, you've um, done all your links, you've updated your website, you've um, just all the stuff, you don't all have to do it on day one. And if you have a day job, for example, it's very nice to have a, a, a pre-order all set up so that you don't have to worry about it. So that's probably the biggest advantage is to actually, well, have it all set up in time and also have a deadline. So for example, I've put end of days, which Arcane Book 9, it's on pre-order, hasn't got a cover or anything because on um, everything except Amazon, you can put it up to a year in advance with no cover um, on iBooks and Kobo and Nook, I think it is, uh, on pre-order right now um, for a November date. So I know I have to have that book done by then and I will, I've given myself quite a lot of time on that one because I'm working on some other things. Um, but essentially having that pre-order there means that I will deliver it by then. And I only tend to load up the Amazon pre-order about 10 days in advance, to be honest. I don't do that. The, I think you can do it three months on Amazon or a month or something. Um, but I just tend to do it almost at the last minute. But I still do it because it means on go live day, it's all there. And of course, on iTunes, you get double counted. So if you, all your pre-orders count, uh, on the day they're sold, but you also get them all in a big batch on the day that you um, that you go live as such, and that's how you can also organise a you know a, a run on the charts, um, the New York Times or the USA Today, because you have to sell on a site other than Amazon. And a really good way to do that is to have a pre-order on iBooks, drive traffic to it. You know, you need to get over 500 sales on that day, in that week. And then uh, there you go, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> um, Patty says, this is great, Joanna. Thank you, Patty. I'm so glad you enjoy it. Um, you know, I always wonder whether these are worth doing and then people seem to enjoy them. So I'm quite happy to be here. Um, Kate says, um, 
first time I've caught you live. What what fun. <laughs> I was wondering how you've been finding doing these live recordings. Are you getting lots of people watching non-simultaneously? Are you using your phone? Oh, right. So, um, and I think that's Kate from, um, from Brighton. So if it is, hi, Kate. And if it's not, hi, Kate, anyway. Um, yes, so... It, the live recordings are amazing. What is kind of crazy is that the organic reach that has been uh, shows on the video, I don't think you see it. Um, if you have a look at the Creative Pen um, page on Facebook, uh, some of the videos have gone to 300,000 people. <laughs> now that means that some people just drop in and look at it and turn away. Um, but the reach is incredible. So in terms of your Facebook page, doing these live things are a really, really good idea. And you get a ton of new likes and shares um, because let's face it, you know, what you're, what you're getting here um, is interaction, kind of interaction with me and you're seeing my face and my smile and my, hearing my voice. This is a human interaction and therefore people can think that you're real as opposed to just someone who shares random stuff on Facebook. So I actually think this is a really good thing and I was very nervous about it. I still kind of am, but um, you guys are great. So, and yes, I'm using my iPhone and I have the laptop next to me, but just the iPhone and it's on a tripod and there you go. Uh, okay. Um, Niall asks, when you hit the saggy middle, how do you get out? Uh, the only way is to write on. <laughs> <laughs> to keep writing. Um, yeah, saggy middle of any book is like, oh, I'm like halfway through and I'm really bored and it's really hard and I've run out of ideas. Um, one of the big things I, I find is to spend some time doing some more research or some replotting. Um, also, you just have, it's that bum glue thing. You just have to like toughen up and write through it. Um, that everyone, anyone who says that writing is not hard work is basically lying. <laughs> so when it comes to the saggy middle, you have to think, oh, well, when I'm at my day job and I don't like it, um, but I need to get paid, I still go in. <laughs> so that's how you need to think about the saggy middle. Uh, Eden says, would you consider making approximately $100 to $300 a month on ebook sales alone for two books after two years encouraging or discouraging? I would consider that encouraging, Eden. $100 to $300 a month with two books is actually pretty blooming good. So I hope that helps. <laughs> it will obviously depend on your genre. Like, for example, there will be poets going, oh my goodness, you are rich. And there'll be romance authors going, oh my goodness, that's pathetic. Um, but this is the thing. I think within my genre, within a sort of decent genre, that's pretty good. Um, keep on writing. <gasps> uh, Henry says Nick sends a lot of emails. Yes, he does. But do you know what? Nick has learned from the Americans and I know there are Americans on the line. Americans are really good at internet marketing. <laughs> so there you go. I don't send lots of emails and I am not great at internet marketing. I'm good at content marketing, which is putting stuff out like this. Um, Apollo says, hello, anyone. Hello, Apollo. <laughs> Becky says, how far out do you plan your various series? Um, do you know, I just, I did a really, well, I did the 100K, but the week before that, I did a really big walk on my own. I was about 35K, I think, and I walked and I was knackered. And the next morning I got up and I wrote a whole plan for all these other spin-off books. And I'll tell you why um, these spin-off books are important. What I've discovered with Risen Gods, um, which is the standalone dark fantasy book I did with Jay Thorne, and it's a blooming good book by the way, uh, but it sells very few copies. And the reason why is because it's standalone and it's hard to find. I'm my, I'm, my name isn't known in that subgenre, so I'm starting in a new subgenre um, without more books it's very difficult and I can't hook it into any of the other books. Whereas I've linked my Arcane series with the London Psychic series with um, Day of the Vikings, which um, features a character from both series, um, Morgan and Blake. And so what I thought was, what I must do with book nine is link it into these new series. So this pagan cycle, the character that's going to be in this in these pagan books is going to be in book nine of the Arcane series so that I can... Um, bring readers across to the new series is very, very hard. 
to start a new standalone series. What you'll see with the best-selling fiction authors, like take someone like Marie Force or Bella Andre, um, you know, uh, even like I was looking at Blake Crouch, she did the Wayward Pines series, um, indie horror writer now turned like seven-figure deal, awesome. Um, his Wayward Pines book trilogy, breakout trilogy, basically. You can't, uh, standalones are so hard. Um, but anyway, uh, how far out do I plan my series? I'm not I'm not really very good at all I do is make sure that I know what's coming with the next book so when I wrote Destroyer of Worlds I knew that the the next one would be End of Days and then by the time I've finished End of Days I know I'll be writing this pagan cycle so I, I don't plan that far out to be honest. Lulu says have you ever read one of your older posts or books and cringed? <laughs> Of course. <laughs> How do you resist the urge to delete older pieces of work? Okay, really good question. If you go to my YouTube channel, go to youtube.com forward slash the creative pen and go to the very earliest video. It's really, really funny. I mean, how I'm, how I'm talking to you now, like I'm a real person. I'm talking to you like a real person. But that first video, I'm talking I'm just not not real at all it's really funny and I've left that there for a reason it's to show development also the first blog posts for the creative pen are there now a uh, slight difference is that um, Pentecost, my first novel, which is now Stone of Fire, I did actually do a rewrite and an edit of that a couple of years after publishing it. Like most people, I self-published too fast and um, rewriting that book later made it into a better book. I didn't change the plot, I just uh, edited it and made it a lot better. Um, but I don't, I don't consider that deleting. Um, I have unpublished a couple of the non-fiction books I wrote way back in 2008 because they're just out of date. You can still find them on, um, on, create, on Amazon because these print books never disappear, but the price is like 499 US. So my point is uh, we're all moving forward. We're all developing our work over time and what I think and I wrote this about a um, Picasso in Malaga uh, we went to the Picasso Museum and what I love about the visual art community is that the visual art community understand a body of work and they do like this is the blue period and this is this period and this Picasso Museum had um you know, pottery that Picasso did when he was seven years old and awful, awful sketches that he did. I mean, if you if you look at some of Picasso's early work, it's terrible. But then, you know, his, some of his most famous paintings have sold for, you know, 300 million or something. And obviously he is, he to me is the epitome of a creative entrepreneur. He was rich, uh, you know, when he was older and doing well with his work. He started off poor like everybody, but he, you know, doubled down with his work. But what I like about the way they displayed his work was here's his early work, here's how you can see his development. And that's what I think we should do with our books. I think everyone understands that you should become better at something by doing more of it. So it's kind of obvious that later books will work. And then you take someone like Stephen King, who I'm a massive fan of. Some of his books now are like, I'm just like, what? That is crazy. I don't, I'm just not a fan of that, that particular book. And that's a period that he went through. And then some of them are just amazing. So let's all just forgive, be a bit forgiving and understand body of work and the length of time that we're going to be doing this stuff, hopefully for the rest of our lives. Hopefully I will be a better writer at 51 than I am at 41. And uh, yeah, but hopefully people will still enjoy my books. Uh, Lisa says, consume creates great idea for blog post ideas. Yeah, it's, t it's basically how I've been blogging for eight years is anything I do out in the world, I then turn it into something else. So it's like thinking of your, um, you know, your creative wells, like a, a pipe and you have to put stuff in so that it comes out the bottom. And that's partly why we went to Tintin Abbey today and the medieval castles and things. I'm preparing in advance for my pagan cycle stuff, um, you know, because I just need to start filling that area of my brain so I can think about it over time because these things take time to think about. Patty says, oh, I might just take a bit of a cup of tea. How are we doing? We all okay? <laughs> uh, 
Oh, I just uh, some comments there. Linda says, thank you for working so hard and sharing so much. Thank you, Linda. And Sue says, I appreciate how open you are with your journey. It's very encouraging to us newbies. Thank you, um, Sue. And of course, remember, we we are all newbies in many ways. Um, I was Oh, I was a newbie with nonfiction, then fiction. Now I'm a newbie with screenwriting. Um, you know, we're all newbies. I'm a newbie with Facebook Live. I mean, I think the most important thing is having an attitude of learning and constant development. I think if you stand still in this, well, in anything, you know, if you stand still in any career, people will go past you. Um, and hey, it's fun. Uh, Patty says, how would you promote a KDP select book that's just launched? that isn't doing well. Okay, so the time has passed when you could just put a book, uh, you know, on KDP Select and expect it to do well. It won't do well on its own. So with Select, you get five days um, free promotion and you also get, or, or a countdown deal. Um, I don't have much or anything. I have a couple of translations in KDP Select, but I don't actively use it a lot. Um, but basically, I would suggest if you have just put out a book, if it's your um, only book, your first book, then use those five days. And then um, basically you have to tell people that it's there. So uh, there are quite a lot of options for paid and free promotion of free books. So you basically have to, um, you know, f uh, just Google a list of places to submit free books and then do the search so it's only in the last like three to six months because these lists actually change all the time. Um, it's unlikely you will get a book bub for a new book because it won't have enough um, reviews, but you could try something like Free Booksy for a start. Um, there's a whole load of them. Anyway, you basically have to tell people when your book is free now. It won't instantly sell but essentially you only launched your book two weeks ago and for indies the launch is not really the point the launch is only the beginning um the uh author earnings data guy did a uh, really good post this week on from rwa where he shared a whole slide pack of um learnings about data and one of the things that he showed there is that traditionally published authors sales tend to spike and then drop but indie or indie books sell he put i think up to three years uh ongoing so indie indie sales are much lower but they go on for a lot longer so don't expect to get a launch spike unless you are more established and have a massive plan in place Uh, Apollo says in the webinar you did with Mark, he said, um, Mark said, don't advertise using Boost, um, but my traffic has been really bad. Uh, but my recent Facebook has been really pushing traffic to my website. Do you still recommend using Facebook ads or using boosting and Facebook ads? Look, you know, to be fair, I think no one can tell you what to do. With all this stuff, you have to try it and see what works for you. Um, any advice from an individual author, myself included, Mark Dawson included, um, or anyone is anecdotal. And that means that it worked for us and that doesn't mean it will work for you. And what works for you might not work for anyone else. Um, so yeah, try it, see what happens. But one of the most important things to do with all this stuff is measure the success and then decide whether you're going to do it again. So for example, we all know from anecdotal and data from everyone in the author community that getting a book bub is the best way to uh, to move volume of books but it's very hard to get a book bub um, hence why I think Facebook Facebook advertising has become the next thing because you're you're in control but it's still um, you know pretty difficult but the thing is to to just try things see what works and then remember that new things come along all the time Michael says, I feel like you've been encouraging, encouraging me and holding my hand from a distance through this whole process. I really appreciate your energy. Thanks, Michael. And uh, I'm really glad to be able to help people. Um, yeah, I really love it. I think this is what's so lovely about the indie community. We can all help each other along the way. So, you know, it's really awesome. 
Sandra says, every time I see you do a live broadcast, I am closer to daring this myself. Okay, come on, Sandra, just book it and do it. So just so you know, what I've done to actually, for you guys to get here, I mean, some of you might just have been around, um, but what I did is I put, um, you know, I used Canva to create a, I'll be asked, uh, you know, and this time yesterday, I put it on Facebook, I put it on Twitter that I was going to be live. So you, you do have to tell people like what time you're going to be there. Um, and then see what happens you also have to prepare for like the first couple of minutes because it takes a while for the for anyone to um, comment or it takes like a bit there's a bit of a time slip there between people commenting and you seeing it on the screen so just be prepared for that uh, Bettina says I love your live videos always learn something new thanks Bettina uh, Lisa says how many edits are you now doing for your fiction uh, good question again um, I I've now done what, nine novels, three novellas, and a short story series. So I can write books. So, and that's really important to say because my first year five books was a lot heavier editing. So now um, what I basically do is I tend to do one draft, then I print it, I hand edit, I do the second draft, that second draft, and it's not rewrites, it's improvements um, really. Then that second draft is what goes to Jen, um, my editor and she mainly does like a story edit and an, and a help level of of stuff um generally the manuscript's pretty clean now as in i don't get loads of red on like i did at the beginning um and after it comes back from her i do the changes then i give it to my proofreader and then it's generally done so it's a lot faster than it used to be but i think that's just because um it's it, more experience uh, Becky says, um, your series planning is inspired, not a grand master plan. <laughs> um, linking across series certainly helps. Good. Uh, okay. Any more tips? Oh, it looks like we're almost out of questions. And, uh, so if you would like to ask any questions, please do add them now. Um, it is 8.41 in the UK. I will be sticking around potentially till nine o'clock if there's enough questions. So if you do have any more questions, please add them. Uh, but two more here. Carol says, any tips on adding more length to a novel draft that is running too short? Interesting question. I would, I would question um, two things. One, what is too short? Uh, if obviously, if you wanted to write a 70,000 word James Patterson style novel and you've only got 20,000, then either you are writing a novella, which you may be, um, or you have to consider making, you know, building the book up. Most people who consider a novel being too short is people who have a traditional publishing contract and often they will actually specify like a 90,000 word um, book and I, I actually see a real problem with this. I find with a lot of books I read that they're too long, that they've been forced into it. What you don't want is to have a forced feeling book. Um, so yeah, see what, uh, see if you really need to add length. If you do need to add length, um, one of the, the uh, big recommendations is add a subplot, um, add another character, another point of view. George R. R. Martin is the perfect example of this. I think there's some kind of rule that says if you add in another new character's point of view, you add X percent to the book, like 10 percent or 20 percent. And what he's done uh, crazily is have so many points of view that his, his books have just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So, um, yeah, subplot extra character, extra point of view. Patty says, uh, thanks so much. These Facebook live sessions feel like sitting in a coffee shop <laughs> chatting with you, uh, which is awesome. Thank you, Patty. Uh, I do find this fun, which is why I think this is the third time or the fourth time I've done this. So um, I do really enjoy helping everyone. Uh, Lisa says, what's the best conference for indies to learn the craft? Uh, to be honest, Lisa, it will depend on your genre. So if you write romance, go to RWA. Um, if you write thrillers, go to Thriller Fest. Um, I don't know about sci-fi and fantasy, um, but all of these conventions, I mean, maybe like Comic-Con was on last week. Oh, I, th I think it's um, Balticon. Balticon might be a sci-fi fantasy one. Anyway, all these conferences have um, a craft track so you can learn uh, from those but also you can do a lot online now so um, consider that. Apollo says is Christmas a bad time to release a novel as an indie? Uh, no 
Christmas is great. Um, any time of year is great, but I know a lot of authors right now are planning for their Christmas launches. Um, in fact, uh, end of days will be out, I think it's a, either the second week of November or December, I can't remember, but what I've done is time it for, um, I'm launching on the same day as another um, author uh, in order to hopefully get some juice see how that works um, but essentially if you write something that's tied into Christmas that's even better so all the romance people um, not all of them but a lot of romance authors will write you know XXX at Christmas and release that at Christmas um, you, you know these seasonal books can do quite well um, but no I don't think Christmas is a bad time to release anything but remember again as I said earlier the launch is not necessarily the um, the big point for indies it's more the long tail sales tracy says would you recommend a book trailer especially if you're writing middle grade or ya um do you know what i i oscillate on book trailers i have some i have them for my fiction and my non-fiction really like my successful author mindset book trailer um which is fantastic and um you know and I really like some of my fiction ones, but I don't know if they actually sell books. I think they might bring up the, uh, you know, awareness of the branding of an author or a book, um, but I'm not sure they sell. I also think that they can be very expensive if you're not doing it yourself. So um, maybe if you have the skills or you want to learn the skills to do it yourself, it certainly can't hurt. Um, but for middle grade YA, yeah, I mean, I... I there, there's a lot of stuff on Snapchat advertising you might consider. I'm not really sure about middle grade YA, to be honest. Uh, Lulu says, we're going to have some tea. It's super hot this evening. I'm, I'm shut into my office. I'm actually really like sweating. Sorry about that. Um, Lulu says, when you were writing your first couple of fiction books, did you share them for free to get your name out there? or via Wattpad. Not sure if there was Wattpad back then though. Yes, it was so long ago. <laughs> um, no, uh, actually what I did, I only put uh, Pentecost, which is now Stone of Fire, uh, on perma-free when I had three books. So basically when I did my first three fiction, I was not going all out on promotion. I, in fact, I still am a lot less confident with my fiction than I am with my non-fiction. I feel quite vulnerable about my fiction. Um, I still think I have so much to learn and I, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot more advertising than I used to, but to be fair, I actually kind of kept quiet about it, except on, you know, the existing platform. So I didn't sell that many fiction books for years. Um, and I hope that's not discouraging. It's just that I didn't go all out on advertising. Um, this year, I really am. I'm really starting to get organised around fiction advertising. But again, a lot of it's box sets, which you need to have three books in order to do. Uh, a lot of it's paid advertising, so you need a budget. Um, yeah. But essentially, I think with fiction, what you've got to remember is the best way to sell more fiction books is to write more fiction books and have a bigger backlist available. And then you will... Um, you know, it's easier and you can put some for free, you can put some on Wattpad, etc, etc. Henry asks, have you now got Scrivener for iOS on your iPhone? Uh, yes, I have. I bought it immediately. I don't even know if I'm going to use it, but to be fair, I wanted to support the guys at Scrivener who are amazing. And I mean, let's face it, I couldn't run my business without Scrivener because it formats the files as well as helping me write my books. And it was, what, 45 US dollars about four years ago, five years ago now. So I bought the app just because I wanted to support them because they really, their, their monetization is just not, it's not so good. <laughs> um, Essa says, uh, thanks so much to the video. That's no worries. I just finished my first novel, intended to indie publish. My editor loves my book and really wants to connect me with an agent considering heading traditional. Um, meanwhile, writing the next book in a series. Yeah, look, you know, as I, I said at the beginning, maybe you come along a bit later, um, Essa, what 
the point is this is a long-term thing so even if you sell that book or that series to a traditional publisher you still have the choice to do other things as long as you check your contracts very very important so um, have a look at Christine Catherine Rush um, chriswrites.com k-r-i-s rights.com um, she's got a series on contracts and deal breakers at the moment she's also got a book and she's updating the book and then she'll release it well she's updating the chapters on her blog and then she'll release it as a book um, but it's called contracts deal breakers um, very very important so if you are considering traditional publishing be very careful with your contracts um, some contracts will you know kind of take possession of your author name so you know if i'd signed a contract where anything i publish under jf pen would belong to this publisher or this agent uh, i did see some contracts like that before um, a few years ago when i was considering this route uh, also some of them will take the rights to your world so that you can't write in that world anymore some of them might take worldwide rights and then not publish there so I'm not anti-traditional publishing at all and I would very much like a big, big book deal wouldn't we all um, but what you have to be careful of is just making sure that you are only signing away the rights you want to. Lily says any plans to visit Florida um, I'll twist myself into a pretzel to meet you thank you Lulu no but I am in Denver Colorado for the digital Com commerce summit in October um, uh, if you but it's really only for people who are wanting to make a living online it's it's not primarily about books um, I am the only speaker on books everyone else is speaking about a lot of other internet sales so if primarily non-fiction authors will be interested um, you can find find that at thecreativepen.com forward slash Denver. Uh, uh, otherwise, I'll probably be in America next year. Um, Natalie says, what does your typical writing day look like? Oh, and Rosemary also says, what is your daily writing routine? Do you write at the same time every day? OK, so I don't have a typical day. <laughs> I'm I was actually talking to my husband about this because I I mean now I've done this goal of this 100k I'm like okay what should I do next um he really loves yoga and I'm like yeah okay I should come to yoga because I'm not very flexible and then I'm like but I never I, I hate committing to doing the same thing every day at the same time it really annoys me um and I get you know I get a bit het up about this sometimes you know like Tim Ferriss is all you must do this at this time and you know the miracle morning stuff and that's just not me so um to be fair I'm pretty disciplined in creating stuff but I don't do it at the same time I mean generally I will do creative stuff in the morning and then I'll do marketing stuff in the afternoon but I it's certainly not every day I I'm more of a binge creator than a daily creator <coughs> so uh you know at the moment I'm just doing research and um tomorrow I do have a whole day in my diary when I'm working on this I'm doing a how to write a novel book and course trying and trying to understand how I myself write novels is quite interesting so I don't actually have a typical writing day um or a routine sorry <laughs> I heard from a friend that you had some tips on publishing poetry. <laughs> Where can I find that? Um, no, <laughs> I don't. I don't really have tips on publishing poetry. All I would say is with poetry, a lot of poets, you know, poets are like hardcore indie because um, generally poets, poets do it for the love of it. Um, but yeah, check out uh, Dan Holloway um, and also, and I've interviewed him on the podcast, also Orna Ross, um, ornaross.com and um, you will, you know, they're poets, they um, do poetry stuff, but you know, it's no different. I think, you know, technically it's no different to the rest of us, but most poets uh, sell a lot less, uh, really. Uh, Sunny says, hi Joanna, I'm watching you from Australia, love your podcast. Fantastic, thank you so much. Okay, we have seven minutes left. Um, Linda says, love to hear you are less structured. <laughs> <laughs> awesome um and hello from ohio usa fantastic um no i am uh, i'm definitely coming back to the u.s next year well later this year obviously for denver and then i'm going to oregon to this um uh sort of training thing which is like a, a personal 
goal. Um, but next year, certainly I'll be coming back to America. Um, okay, so I think it looks like we are out of questions. I've really enjoyed um, talking to you this evening. Thank you so much for coming along. And uh, I will definitely do this um, again. Uh, Niall says, what can we expect on the podcast in the next few weeks? And Andrew actually says, uh, do you believe writers only have one writing voice? Great questions because tomorrow on the podcast I have two things for you. The first is an extensive update on my 100k when I'll be talking about all my lessons learned and my second uh, thing is an interview with Ros Morris on your author voice. So um, and then also coming up on the podcast um, I will be talking to Ellen Bard about self-care for authors. That was an awesome interview. I've got um, Alan Baxter who's awesome about short stories. Um, we've got um, Julie Huss, J.A. Huss, talking about romance. Julie is like kick-ass romance author, so that's very exciting. Lots coming up on the podcast. Um, just while we're the few uh, few last questions, um, Sue says, uh, "How did I learn the craft? Do you have any formal training? No, no formal training at all. But I tell you what, in the last ten years, I've spent." a lot of money and a lot of time learning from books, uh, courses, live courses, online courses. Um, I'm, you know, constantly learning the craft and also writing. So I think we all are learning. Um, and the, I think the really good thing is that uh, we can just help people who are one step behind us. So there we go. Um, Yes, so uh, Lulu says, do some of your family don't read your dark fiction? No, most of them don't. In fact, my mum st stays away from my fiction because uh, she gets disturbed by it and she w w worries that she might have brought me up badly or something. But <laughs> I actually think people who write dark books are some of the most psychologically healthy around, you know, because you get it out there on the page, uh, you know, not getting political, but a lot of these people who are doing bad things at the moment, if they just wrote horror books we'd all probably be fine. <laughs> um, Lisa says, how does this live broadcast get posted on the podcast? This doesn't go on the podcast. Um, this goes on YouTube and it also goes on the blog. So you can always watch the replays of the Facebook Live on the blog or on YouTube uh, this week. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'm definitely going to sign uh, off now. I'm like sweating. It's gross. It's so hot. Um, but look, lovely to see you all. And um, I will do this again sometime in August and I will let you know when.